In this video, for topic 2.8, we're going to be exploring tonicity and osmoregulation. For practically all biological solutions, water is the solvent. Dissolving a solute into a solvent forms a solution. Biological solutions include things like blood, invertebrates, and hemolymph present in many invertebrates, cytoplasm within individual cells, the different kinds of sap that travel through the vascular tissue of plants, saliva, and much more. Because of the chemical reactions taking place inside of cells are in an aqueous environment, the manner in which cells maintain their water balance, as well as the factors that influence water movement into and out of them, is critical for a cell survival. This video is going to take a look at and explain how the potential movement of water across a membrane can be mathematically determined. A hydrophilic substance is one that will dissolve easily in water. Recall from an earlier presentation that they do so as they are surrounded by water molecules forming a hydration shell. Dissolved substances can be individual ions, relatively small, or large polar molecules, like many proteins. But one key component to remember about the movement of water is this. It's not the variety of solutes that matter but rather the total amount of all the different kinds of solutes and their concentrations summed up. We can therefore compare solutions to one another quantitatively based on their relative total concentrations. A solution that has a greater total concentration of dissolved solutes is referred to as hypertonic. Conversely, a solution with fewer total dissolved solutes is hypotonic. If two solutions were found to have equal solute concentrations, they would be referred to as isotonic. At this point, it is important to note that these terms are relative terms, meaning that they must be utilized in a way that allows the comparison of two or more solutions to one another. For example, a red blood cell, when compared to a much more concentrated hypertonic solution, like salt water, would be considered hypotonic. But that same red blood cell, when compared to distilled water, which has no dissolved solids, would be considered hypertonic. The passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential is called osmosis. Water potential, represented by the Greek letter psi in the equation below, is used to determine the direction of the net movement of water across a membrane. Water always travels from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential across a membrane. There are many variables that determine the water potential of a solution, but for our purposes we will focus on these two, psi sub p, pressure potential, and psi sub s, solute potential. Pressure potential is the result of physical mechanical pressure exerted on a cell and is analogous to filling a balloon with water. As more water enters, pressure potential increases. This component of water potential is especially important in how plant cells maintain their rigidity. Solute potential is the component of water potential that results due to the influence of all those dissolved solutes within the solution. In a system that is open to the environment, such as one without a rigid cell wall, pressure potential is equal to zero, leaving solute potential as the primary variable useful in determining water potential. Setting pressure potential equal to zero effectively makes water potential equal to solute potential. Here's the equation for solute potential. Before breaking down each of those variables, please make careful note of the fact that solute potential for a solution is negative. The first variable, I, represents the ionization constant of the solute. Some solutes, like sodium chloride, dissociate into sodium ions and chloride ions when they dissolve. Hydrochloric acid, or HCl, dissociates into hydrogen ions and chloride ions when dissolved in water. Therefore, sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid would be great examples of solutes with an ionization constant of 2. 
2 representing the number of particles of the dissolved solutes. Glucose, on the other hand, does not dissociate into any smaller particles and remains as a single molecule surrounded by a hydration shell of water. Glucose's ionization constant would therefore be 1. The second variable, C, is the concentration in molarity, or moles per liter. R is the pressure constant and will always be 0 0.0831. Its unit is liter bars per mole kelvin. And the final variable is temperature. For this equation, temperature is represented using kelvin. If we do a bit of dimensional analysis, removing the moles, the liters, and the kelvins, we're left with the unit for potential, which is bars. Just like atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, or tor, bars are a unit of pressure. The highest possible value that can be calculated for solute potential would be zero. In fact, this wouldn't even be a solution because it is represented by distilled water with a concentration of zero and has no solutes whatsoever. Now let's take a look at some practice at working with the solute potential equation. We're going to explore a variety of solutions individually as well as comparatively to see how changing the value of the variables ultimately affects solute potential. Our first example is 0.5 molar glucose at 20 degrees Celsius. Because glucose does not ionize in water, this value is one. Concentration is 0.5. Pressure constant is, of course, constant, and the temperature is 293 Kelvin. Plugging all of those variables into the equation yields negative 12.17 bars. But just like the terms hypotonic and hypertonic, this value by itself is not particularly useful since we don't have another solution to compare it to. So let's remedy that. The second solution is a 0.5 molar sodium chloride solution at 20 degrees Celsius. Concentration is the same and temperature is the same, but what's different is that sodium chloride ionizes into two particles in solution. Therefore, I is equal to 2. This changes the resulting solute potential to be negative 24.35 bars. The sodium chloride solution has double the number of particles in solution, meaning that it is hypertonic to the glucose solution. If these two solutions were on either side of a membrane, water would flow from an area of higher water potential, which is the glucose, to the area of lower water potential, which is the sodium chloride. After all, negative 12.17 is greater than negative 24.35. So how does changing the concentration affect solute potential? Let's compare that 0.5 molar sodium chloride to a 0.6 molar solution at the same temperature. The only variable that would be different in this case would be the concentration equal to 0.6. The solute potential would be calculated then as negative 29.22 bars. The conclusion that can be drawn is increasing concentration of a solution results in a decrease of solute potential. If we check out the effect of temperature, we see that temperature and solute potential have an inverse relationship. In order to understand why changing the concentration of a solution affects solute potential, let's revisit hydration shells. Recall that when water molecules dissolve a solute, they surround that solute due to their attraction to it. Once any given water molecule is participating in a hydration shell, it is no longer free to diffuse via osmosis across a membrane. Why are those water molecules unable to do so? Let's attempt to quantify this concept with a simple model. This illustration shows a solution of some concentration on the right side of, so, of a selectively permeable membrane and pure water on the left. The solute potential on the left would therefore be equal to zero. Pressure potential would also be equal to zero because the system is open to the environment. The result, water potential is equal to zero. On the right, water potential would be something less than zero due to the presence of the solutes. Each of those solute particles has a collection of water molecules surrounding it, the hydration shell. Now let's use our imagination. 
on the left would be some quantity of water molecules. Since it would be impractical to count each water molecule, let's instead say that there are X number of water molecules on the left. On the right, initially, there would have been an equal quantity of water molecules. But as solutes are added, it requires Y number of water molecules to form a hydration shell around each of those 11 solute particles. Therefore, the number of water molecules not participating in hydration shells on the right is something less than X. Because the solutes themselves are prevented from traveling across the membrane, in this case due to their size, the water molecules associated with them are also unable to travel across the membrane. So on the left, there is a water potential of zero and more water molecules that are free to travel across the membrane. And the right is hypertonic with fewer free water molecules. This will result in a net movement of water from the left to the right. Here's a table that will help to relate some terminology and phrases. Associated with low water potential would be a high solute concentration, whereas high water potential is a lower solute concentration. More solutes means a solution that is hypertonic, fewer solutes hypotonic. A higher osmolarity or osmotic concentration is related to being hypertonic, and the opposite is true for a hypotonic solution. In a hypertonic solution, because there are more solute particles, more water molecules will participate in hydration shells. But in a hypotonic solution with fewer solid particles, the opposite is true. Regardless of how the solutions are described, the movement of water across a membrane will always occur in the direction indicated. If you'd like more time to view this table, feel free to pause the video now. Although every living thing requires water, they do not require it in the same osmotic concentrations. Organisms called osmoconformers have an osmotic concentration that mirrors their environment. These kinds of organisms essentially lack a homeostatic mechanism for osmotic concentration. An osmoregulator, on the other hand, has processes, mechanisms, and structures to maintain a consistent water balance. This is a good time to note, however, that regardless of whether or not an organism is an osmoconformer or an osmoregulator, extreme environments with either very high or very low external osmolarity can cause harm and even be life-threatening. Aquatic organisms that are osmoregulators have evolved mechanisms by which they can maintain an appropriate osmotic concentration. They can excrete solutes through their gills, urine, and other body surfaces. For terrestrial animals, living in water necessitates more complex mechanisms for maintaining water balance and to retain water, avoiding dehydration. Vertebrates like mammals, birds, and reptiles rely on kidneys for that function. The nephron is the functional unit of a kidney and beautifully illustrates a variety of transport mechanisms, including osmosis. Depending on the size of the organism and the size of the kidneys, a kidney contains thousands or even millions of these nephrons. The nephron functions by actively and passively transporting solutes across membranes. As the solute moves, water potential decreases on the other side of the membrane, and water therefore follows. At each stage along the way, the nephron functions by manipulating water potential through the movement of solutes, which results in the movement of water, allowing the animal to retain it. That concludes our exploration of topic 2.8. Thank you for watching and take care.